All right, let's stand by and get myself organized like I always do. For you guys, I didn't even shave. It's already been one of those days. So, can you hear me? <laughs> That's the first thing. Trying a different room today. I don't even know if it's echoing or if it sounds okay. Scoot this over a little bit. Um, we have volume. Audio check. Test, test. Hello, everyone. <laughs> What's there? Oh, I feel stubbly. Okay, there's a yup. I'm thinking yup means yes, you can hear, so that's good. Um, today's topic is going to be about automatic top off systems. So let me show you. You might have saw the preview picture on Facebook. I shared this last night. These are the things we're going to talk about today. But before I get into the individual items, I wanted to actually just discuss the principle of top off first. So jump back here. And oh, one more thing. I have to always do this. Bing. All right, I feel more professional now. <laughs> uh, when you run a saltwater tank every single day, water evaporates naturally. And when that evaporation takes place, it actually affects the salinity because the water is leaving and the salt is staying in the tank. And when that happens, you end up with salinity that rises higher and higher until you drop in more fresh water. And so historically, we would just pour in some more water manually. If it's a small tank, you just add a couple of cups. If it's a bigger tank, you add a gallon or two. If it's a big tank like mine, you add a few gallons. And the thing is, is that, and you know, these are habits that we don't even know. These are things you learn over time. But when I first set up my 29 gallons so long ago, I didn't add water until I felt like it. And I just watched the water level lower in the tank more and more. And when it was down about this far, I dumped in a bunch of water. And when you think about what I was actually doing, it was a terrible system because what happened was the salinity had risen in the tank to a much higher level, which to be honest, I wasn't even measuring. I just assumed it was fine. And I dumped in the RO water and you could just see the RO water mixing with the salt and think about the livestock. It just got slammed with fresh water out of nowhere, which is totally unusual for the ocean, right? So I, uh, cha I, changed, I changed my attitude and I said, okay, I'm gonna start putting top off water in the tank every day when I feed, because I feed every single day. So I would pour in some water and then I would add the fish food and the tank salinity <clears throat> was maintained. It was far better. What I'd like to do is suggest that you go one step further than manually adding it and that's to automate this task. Mark Thomas asks, why does everyone assume my name is spelled with a K? <clears throat> and why does everyone spell his name with a C? <laughs> I don't know. Give me your C. They belong to me. So let's avoid fluctuation. Let's automate our system. So I want to talk about these kits really quick. So In the uh, lower left corner, you can see the ATK, which is Automatic Top-Off Kit from Neptune Systems. I just got that a week ago. To its right is the IceCap ATO, which I also got about a week, week and a half ago. In the back behind it is the Top Off Kit Deluxe, which is a DIY kit. And then in the upper right, or I'm sorry, upper left corner is a Smart ATO Micro. I need to discuss the Smart ATO with you for a moment because that kit uh, is the only one available now. The regular Smart ATO is no longer on the market. And I asked why. And they said because the Smart ATO has um, become too uh, problematic in that it beeps all the time and tells you that it has uh, stopped running. Uh, that's the way it's designed. And uh, most of these kits these days are designed to stop any more water from being added and to beep and to give you a heads up. So we want to have something that we can reliably trust on because if you're traveling, it does you no good that your top off kit stopped adding water and started beeping nonstop while you're gone for the next five days. What if it happens the day you leave and for five days you have no top off? That's bad news. Now, if you have a tank sitter, they can come in, they can unplug it and plug it in to reset it and it's good to go again until the next visit, which it may work flawlessly for the next five days. 
I just talked with someone today and he was explaining to me that his own tank, he has a smart ATO micro, and it's beeped for him quite a bit. And I asked him what he meant by that because I've been running mine for um, 20 months and in the 20 month period, I've probably had it beep three times. Now the regular smart ATO, it can work fine for three weeks and all of a sudden it wants to beep every single day and every day I wake up and have to unplug it and plug it in, which is kind of annoying. And then all of a sudden it's right back to happy as can be. So it's time to retire that unit just because I need something that I can count on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 30 days a month, etc. Um, and what I'm going to be installing next will be the ATK from Neptune Systems. So let me show you some close-ups. I'm going to switch cameras and then we're going to discuss hands-on what these products do. Actually, I'm going to change the angle here and that way I can swing back to you guys. Ah, nah. We'll just leave it the way it is. Don't want you to see too much behind the scenes. So here is a float switch. And these are what we've been using for quite a while to add water to our aquarium. And what happens is the water lifts it up and keeps it up. And as evaporation occurs, it drops, which would trigger a signal to some kind of device saying, add more water. And as you added the water, the float switch would rise, 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 turn off the pump, and no more water is added. That was the original principle. And that's what comes in this kit right here which is the Top It Off Deluxe Kit. Now, as I mentioned, this kit is a DIY kit. I have two left in stock. I'm happy to sell them and get rid of them because I'm done selling it. And inside this kit, you've got the instruction sheet, which shows you exactly how to do every stage of this. And I've got a blog on Reef Addicts that shows exactly how to install it. Comes with free float switches. It comes with float switch protectors, which you would use to put around the float switch. You drill some holes in here and install it in the cap, and that way a snail can't touch it and trigger it accidentally. It comes with a project box that you would install the actual mechanism that makes it run. You would use this board along with this relay that you install on here. And that is now installed. And then you would run power to one side and low voltage to the other to run these float switches. Included was this space age material, which is actually kind of crazy. You heat this up in boiling water and it turns clear and it bends in any shape you want. And you could make a, a little hanger and bend, you know, you could take scissors and cut it and bend it up and connect your float switch, hang this over the top. And as it cures, it turns white again and gets hard. So there's a couple of sticks of that. Here are some extra pieces you'll need. Here is the power supply. Oh. Let's see, let me make sure, yeah. This is the power supply to actually feed the relay block. And then we've got uh, another float switch cover. So anyway, this kit here is like about 50 bucks, right? And you're gonna spend a couple hours putting it together, maybe less, and you've got a top off system. And the only other thing you need with this kit is gonna be some kind of a power head to move the water from the holding container, you know, the R reservoir, to pump water into your sump. Now, next one we're going to talk about, move this. I've got things in the background hiding to lift things up. The Smart ATO, I have a couple of these in stock as well. We're going to open all these up. Someone's going to receive these and say, you opened these. I'm like, yes, they're YouTube famous. <laughs> the Smart ATO Micro has its own little feed pump. Can you see that? Little tiny pump. I mean, that is crazy small. Power supply. This is your sensor that will actually measure the water through the wall of the sump. And you can use this inside a nano tank also, like a, because it holds onto the back of whatever, like the back of a nano system with a magnet, and then sensors on the inside measuring water. So it could be a completely dark, it could be an opaque sump, it could be a black sump, green, blue, whatever. And this is your power supply, and this is also the part that beeps. So, you've, I said power supply, I'm sorry, it's more like a... A brick. So here is your power supply. This would then plug into this guy, and then your pump would plug into it. Shall I open everything up for you? Make this look used? 
I'm making so much noise crinkling. All right, we're just gonna open everything up. Why not? So here is that sensor I was talking about, and here is the magnetic holder that would fit on the outside of your sump or the back of your tank. And you can see it's holding. Uh, let's try that one more time. So now you can see how the sensor would hold through a device. <laughs> I cannot do this demonstration on YouTube. There we go. See, it's holding. And so a light would turn on when this is plugged in. And you would plug in your power supply. It actually is marked on there. It says power and it says pump. So you'd plug in your power on one side. You plug in your tiny itty bitty pump into the other side. It comes with all the tubing that you would use. You can push water up with this microscopic pump six and a half feet high, which is amazing to me. There's a little clip that you can then put on the side of your tank or on your sump, and you would put the tubing through there to hold the tubing in place. And lastly, there is this awesome little check valve, or I'm sorry, a uh, siphon brake that you install in line. So you would have the tubing come from the pump, go to here, and then from here to your tank. And what it does is it's sucking in air as it's moving water through. So you'll have water and air bubbling into the sump itself, but then when the power turns off, because it's sucking in air, it breaks the siphon, and you don't end up bringing all the water from the reservoir into the sump or bringing the sump water into the reservoir. I loved this kit because everything was included. There was no trip needed to Home Depot. Uh, that one sells for $125. Then uh, we'll do ice cap next because it's just handy. Um, this kit here, nice little box. Comes with all of its little accessories within. So you've got your sensors right here. This is a liquid waterline sensor, not unlike the Smart ATO. Got two different sensors. You've got your tubing. You've got your magnetic holder. You've got a tubing holder. This is the brain part. And it's very important that when I, matter of fact, I had showed this picture to someone yesterday and they texted me instantly and told me how this part got wet and of course it shorted out. So you would install this in a way where salt water is not going to get into it. You've got your power supply and you've got your itty bitty tiny pump. Looks really familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> so, that is the kit from Ice Cap. And again, it holds on magnetically onto the side of the sump. You would install a sensor here, and you install a sensor here. So basically, you've got redundancy. You've got a low and you've got a high. And that way, if the low one fails, you've got one to take over half an inch up. It prevents you from adding a lot of water to your tank accidentally all at once. Again, this has everything in the kit that would pretty much take care of your needs. Um, I think this one retails for... I think it's $125 also. Maybe $135. Alright, and then finally, we are going to look at the ATK. Now this came from Neptune Systems. I just recently got this, and so I got a chance to take a look at it. It comes with everything inside that you need. And I'm probably going to say this incorrectly, but I believe, yeah, you can use a standalone or you can use it with an Apex. So if you don't own an Apex, you can still use the ATK. And inside the ATK, you've got the main mechanism and everything's already pre-built for you. So you don't have to do anything except install it. So you've got right here is a magnetic holder. This would fit on the inside of your sump and it's going to measure the water at this point. And it's going to measure the water at this point if this one were to fail for some reason. So again, you got redundancy. But then you also have a float on the back. So if both of these were to fail, this will come up and stop any more water from being added to your tank. Now, how does water get into all of this or how does it get into your sump? Your water would be draining down through a tube. Tubing is provided. It will go into here and it will actually be trickling out of this lo location right here the entire time. So when it's adding water, it trickles here. And then when this triggers the water level at this height, it stops. If for some reason it didn't stop, this would then measure and it should stop it. If that didn't stop it, then the float will rise up and it will stop it. And you would just adjust the height of this to what is perfect for your sump. And of course, because it's magnetic like the other two, 
you can place it as high or as low in your sump to get that sweet spot that you prefer. In addition, what else is in the box? Show you the tubing. You've got your power supply. Um, not that it matters, this one is uh, 24 volt. You've got a Aquabus cable if you were to hook it up to your Apex. You've got your pump, which is the feed pump that feeds your um, water from here. See, it draws from the base, water comes out the top, goes through the tubing, and sends it into your display, into your, uh, well, it could go to the display tank or it go into the sump. I would obviously hook it up in my sump. And then you've got a couple more fittings. This one here fits on top of here, and then you put your tubing right onto that. That's super easy. And this fitting here is your uh, siphon brake. So you're going to take this little guy here, and you're going to install it somewhere in the line. Tubing comes in, tubing continues over to the display uh, to the sump, and then it would break the siphon here by sucking in air, and that way you end up with no back siphon of water, no water going either direction, except when you need to send water over. This one, I believe, retails for $199, if I'm correct. So, and if I got that wrong, someone can correct me. So the ATK is what I'm gonna be installing on my 400 gallon next. And then if you say, look, I'm not spending any of this money, Mark, I wanna use gravity, then you would use one of these guys. So this right here, move this other way, this is a adjustable float valve, and these would fit in the side of your sump or the, top, or the top rim of your sump. You can install this way, and right through the wall of the sump, here's your sump wall, and then as the water rises, it lifts and shuts off the water. The problem is, this only shuts off the water when the, uh, when the water rises, it shuts off the water with a rubber flapper inside here. And that little flapper, it's like putting your thumb over the end and just holding it shut. And you know when you do that with a garden hose, water bleeds out anyway. So your source water may continue to add a little bit at a time, a couple of drips. And if it's hooked up directly to an RO system, it will keep adding a little bit of water and run your RO system full, to full bore. Even though only a little bit is coming out here, a whole bunch is going down the waistline nonstop throughout the day, throughout the night, until you notice it. So some people set up this with a reservoir that's up high and they use gravity. So they fill that up with five gallons of water and then this would be their top off into their sump for a few days while they travel. All right. I'm back. Now, uh, let's see. Hopefully all of that worked. <laughs> I wanna see if I can see your conversation. I'm hoping you guys typed stuff while I was chatting. Yes, you did. Thank you. And it looks like you guys have been asking and answering questions over in chat, which is awesome. At some point, I am planning to include the chats in these videos when they release. So that way, you, uh, if you're a viewer later on, you can see what the conversation was about. Let's see. Since I don't really see a question pointing to me right now, I want to go ahead and uh, go into the point of what to do when you're traveling. Because a top off through you know every single day while you're at home is easy. But when you travel, you can take it a step further uh, so that way your tank is taken care of. No matter what device you're using to top off your tank, the amount of water sitting in reserve is going to limit how long you can leave. So when I had to go to Macna a few years ago, I had hooked up a top-off system that I had to refill every three days. And I put in 15 gallons of water, and in three days it was empty, and I had to put in 15 gallons of water, and so forth. And I did that for six years. <laughs> when I went to Macna, I knew I was going to be gone five or six days, and I didn't know if I could ask the person at the time watching my tank if they were willing to dump in, you know, 15 gallons of water. And I thought, what can I do since I'm not going to be here? And what I ended up doing was setting up a big trash can by my sump, that you know you could basically you know a 33 gallon trash can an average trash can and I filled it up about halfway with water so I had about no I had more than half in there because I had in there about yeah no <laughs> I can't remember 
I probably had about 20, 25 gallons of water in there. And I added a little bit of extra water to my sump before I left town. And that way I knew there'd be plenty of top off water uh, for the duration I was gone. And why do I put a trash can next to the tank? Because I'm not home and it's not in my way. So even if you have a tank sitter, if you have trust issues and you think that they may not do it right or they might make a mistake or they're not listening, if you can set up some kind of automation to do the bulk of it where they're just doing the absolute bare minimum, which in my case is bare minimum, please feed the fish, right? And I have samples of food um, or uh, little containers of food for each day so it can't be mixed up. My tank sitter knows exactly what to do, but I still prepare it as best I can to make his life easier so when he shows up, it's just ready. But having the top off system set up where they're not dealing with the RO system, they're not having to check things, that's my preference. And that's what I recommend for you guys. All right. I see a couple people are talking about RO systems and hooking them directly up to your sump, which is very dangerous. And I highly recommend against doing that because an RO system is going to put out as much water as it can until you notice the problem. If you have a 100 gallon a day system like this one person mentioned, it's going to add 100 gallons of water in a 24 hour period. And obviously your sump can't hold 100 gallons of water, no matter how big your sump is. So you're going to end up with water on the floor. If you uh, hook it up that way, not only is there the risk of really flooding your home nonstop, especially if you're gone for a couple of days, the, and of course changing the salinity of the water because you added way too much fresh water, the other problem is that an RO system that triggers on and off and on and off to add water as needed, let's say five, six times a day, it actually burns up the membrane more quickly. The membrane is the workhorse. It's supposed to last you years, but people that hook up RO systems directly to their sump find that their membrane got ruined in a matter of months, and that's because it triggered on and off way too often. They're not designed to run that way. They're designed to run really hard and then turn off. So I tell people, run your RO system once or twice a week to make your top off water, to make your drinking water. And you know, collect that water and then shut it off until it's time to turn it on again. And that way your membrane will last a good long time, your DI resin won't be wasted, because that's the other thing. And I've got a video about it on my channel about TDS creep, so if you haven't seen it yet, please watch it. But the bottom line is, every single time your RO system turns on for the first few seconds, it dumps all the high TDS water into your DI resin and devours the DI. So even if you run a double DI, you are ruining the first DI way quicker because you're putting in that first batch of, let's say, 100 TDS for 90 seconds into your DI resin. So do not do that. Uh, Pete Mancuso asks, do any of the ATO units come with a warranty? Yes, they do. Uh, I believe Smart ATO is a year. Uh, ATK from Apex, I don't know, but I'm sure it's on their website. And then uh, the ice cap ATO, I don't know, <laughs> but I'll find out. <laughs> I didn't remember to look that up before we started this conversation. The smart ATO micro had a really nifty thing, which I believe the ice cap has as well. Oh, it says right on the ice cap box, one year warranty. So there you go. Uh, the way it worked is that when it added water to your tank, it measured how long it added water. So as it's topping off, it's counting seconds. And then it turns off. And the next time it turns on, it compares to the last time to see how long it ran before and how long it's running now. And I believe that if it ran three times longer than the last run, that's what triggered it to shut off. And then you had, and then it would beep and you'd have to unplug it and reset it. But it gave you a chance to deal with whatever the heck was going on that caused it to go crazy. Also, as with anything we have, you have to clean it. So the sensor that's in your sump could build up some kind of slime coat on it. It could have algae on it. It could have uh, bubbles on it, you know, from the sump. And you need to brush it off with a toothbrush. So, for example, if you um, set this up and you're cleaning your skimmer, that'd be a great time to reach down there with a little toothbrush and brush off the sensor really quick. Make sure it's nice and clean. Make sure there's no crud accumulating around the perimeter of the water, you know, where the water touches the walls of the sump. You want that to be nice and clean. Um, the ATK works with a module if you want to hook up to the Apex. And then the module would connect to the brain of the Apex, 
and it would send you text alerts of what's going on with your top-off system because of those um, electric sensors. So having electronic sensors allows you a little bit more control from a remote situation and check to see how things are going with your system. Uh, while I'm pausing here and letting you guys type more thoughts, I want to mention I uploaded a video last night. It was the four-year anniversary of my 400-gallon Reef. So if you haven't watched that yet, it's on the channel waiting for you. And uh, it was fun uh, to do a quick update, but boy, Considering where the tank was a couple months ago and then showing the new look, it, it, it's just, it feels wrong because it doesn't look the same. <laughs> and one person mentioned, you're not happy. I'm like, oh, well, you know, I'm always picky. So I am, I am happy with my tank. I'm happy that things are growing. I love looking at the, the, the new tips bursting out of the Acropora, the Shadowcaster. It's got 30 tips growing off of it all over the place, like a little tiny urchin. And it's really exciting. I um, I look forward to seeing where it goes in the next three to six months. I think it's going to really fill in nicely. I need to get a few more SPS corals. I'd like some more acros. I need some more acros in my life. Uh, D from Brooklyn says he looks forward to seeing the Anemone Tank anniversary video. I definitely need to do that uh, in the upcoming... Boy, I still have videos I have not released yet. Ugh. It bugs me when I know I've got stuff that's not done yet. Dale J asks, how do you know when your membrane in your RO system is bad and that his is about three years old? Membrane life used to be three to five years, but because our water quality changes from county to county, the number has changed from one to five years. So the way to know if your membrane is going out, if it's failing or if it has failed, is what is coming out of it. Basically, Measure your TDS today of the RO membrane, the water coming out of the RO before the DI. Measure that number, make a note, save it somewhere. Even if you put a little note card up on the RO system with today's date. Then in six months, measure again and see what's coming out of the RO membrane. If the number is kind of close to where it was, everything's fine. If the number has risen significantly, like if it's shot up to 80 TDS coming out of the membrane, or if no water is coming out of the membrane, it just has almost come to a stop. And at that point, something is really wrong. The membrane is probably clogged up. You also want to measure your wastewater ratio, <laughs> ratio, and you want to make sure that the waste ratio is correct. So if your 100 gallon a day system has a four to one waste ratio, you would put a two liter bottle of water, or I'm sorry, a two liter bottle on the counter with a second two, basically you want two bottles that are identical size. Two buckets, two bottles, whatever you want to use. Put the waste line into one and put the good line in the other and turn it on. When the waistline is full to the top, the RO side should be about 25% full. That's four to one. If all of a sudden you're getting 10 to one, you know that the membrane has to be replaced. Nish Evan has gone off topic and asked, what do you recommend for test kits? I haven't purchased any yet. Well, I'm gonna say ELOS because that's what I use. Um, Lava Cyst or Cyst T asks, what are your thoughts on the Red Sea Reefers ATO? I've seen that one at Macna, and it looked pretty intricate, uh, but I haven't actually played with it personally. These right here, the Top It Off kit I used for several years on my reef. Then I used the Smart ATO, and I'm using the Smart ATO Micro. I have not tried out the ice cap yet, and uh, I need to try it since I'm offering it in my shop, and I like to sell the things I use myself. And the ATK is where I'm going next, which is from Apex, because I'm upgrading my Apex system, too. Someone says that the ATK in Norway cost $356? U.S. dollars? It's $156 more than in the U.S.? It seems shocking. Reef Eco asks, any luck with higher end top off pumps, Stenner, Liter Meter, WMX, etc. Uh, to be honest, I go the other direction. I go to the least expensive choices usually when it comes to top off. For many years with the deluxe top it off kit that I showed you, I was using the, uh, the Aqualifter, which is a little tiny pump that costs 11 bucks online and water would go in one side and then pump out the other. And I would draw the water into the pump and then trickle it into the sump. 
Oh, another thing, you know, I talked about siphon and back siphon several times. What I did not mention and or not emphasize, the tube where the water goes into your sump needs to be secured. Whether you use the clamps that they give you or drill a hole in the rim of your sump and put the tube through it or zip tie it to some PVC plumbing, you want that tube to stay in the sump because if it flops out of the sump while you're cleaning the collection cup and then the top off turns on and it's just pouring water next to your sump, obviously it's not going to turn off because the sensor never senses a change of water level and it's going to keep getting the floor or the cabinet wetter and wetter and wetter. So I recommend that you have the tube secured inside the sump to something where it's permanent and I recommend you have it up high rather than down low in the sump and that is so that way it again it has to do with back siphoning water um, and that way when you turn off the return pump of the water level rises in the sump it doesn't just get the salt into the tubing from the RO water that goes in. I like to have it up high. I like to hear the water going into my sump, to be honest, because if I'm walking past the tank and I hear it topping off and I keep hearing it and I keep hearing it, it brings to my attention that I need to check into it. But if it's a dead silent system, I might be more prone to miss something that's happening that's going off the rails. D from Brooklyn asked me, since you've trimmed so much off the top of your reef, have you had to drop your light intensity? There was a big dark area before. No, and uh, you can't change light intensity of metal halides. <laughs> my lights are my lights. And actually, uh, I was happy to bask everything with a ton of light finally after that huge shadow from the shadow caster. Uh, it's gone. So I'm very pleased with that. Uh, Hank Busters asked, or I'm sorry, Hank Basters said, in which part of the sump do you place the float switches? Your float switches, sensors, uh, float valves, they always go in the return zone because that's the area that will drop in your sump. Water's pouring into the sump, it's going to the skimmer section, it flows across, and maybe it goes to a refugium, and then it flows across in the return zone. As the day elapses, if you weren't to add any water, you'll notice the return zone gets lower and lower and lower. So you put your top off in the return zone because you want to keep that at the exact same height all the time. Um, Maple Leaf said, Mark, you can also make it easy to turn it off or unplug it. What are we talking about? Can you expound on that? Because I didn't understand. Jim asked me, do you use the Salini probe with the Apex to monitor your ATO? I do not. I um, have not hooked up a Salini probe to my tank ever, but I have the new Apex 2016 here, so I believe I will start to use it and see how that works out. The um, I've been just testing with a refractometer. I have a handheld and I have a digital. I, I really like the one from Milwaukee. I read people that say they hate it, I love it. I think it's super easy to use. You just put your, your water sample on the lens, it measures, it tells me my numbers, and I can check salinity three, four, five times in a row to make sure it's a consistent number. I also will use accuracy, which is a problem from Two Little Fishies, and I'll put that on the lens and see if the digital refractometer measures 35 PPT, since that is my calibration solution to verify it's on track. Uh, Reefing with O says, Mark, the ATK is awesome, especially when connected to the Apex. The pump, uh, it comes with, handles head pressure well. And that's a good point because where are you sending the water to? I tend to take all my top off water and send it into the sump, but you definitely can have it go straight into the display tank. Having it push up six and a half feet or so is not unheard of, and it's actually nothing wrong with dumping it up there. It could also dump into the overflow box of your tank, and that way it's mixing with salt water as it comes down into the sump. Uh, it's just a, another way, of, another place of putting it. And as long as the end of your tubing is not submerged, it won't back siphon water back into the reservoir. Uh, Sheldon Jessup asked me, which Abyss pump am I using right now? It is the Abyss 200. And um, I've been running it now for about two, two and a half months. Oh, okay, Maple Leaf expounded on his comment before. Is there a way to turn off the ATO like in an emergency or when you're doing maintenance? You definitely want to do that. Matter of fact, when you're doing a water change or you're really cleaning out your sump, I tend to turn off a lot of devices. I turn off my heaters. I turn off my return pump. I turn off my skimmer. Um, I turn off all the alarms on the Apex because I don't want to hear it chiming at me for two minutes or longer. And I that way I can go in there, I can pump all the water out, I can clean out any detritus, I can scrape it clean if, I have, if I'm really motivated. 
And then I don't have to worry about the heaters coming on and cracking. I don't have to worry about um, the probes mismeasuring and turning lights off because the temperature has changed. I mean, I just disable all that stuff. I actually created a button. I call it the blue button on my Apex. And when I push the blue button, it turns off all those things for me at once. And it could turn off a top-off system as well um, for 45 minutes that lets me tinker in the sump. And then it, everything comes back to life because by then I'm done and there's new water in the sump and it's ready to re resume. Carlos, you are late. Just joined the live stream. We've been here for 35 minutes and we're all doing great. The smart ATO, the regular one is gone. All that's available now is the micro model. Um, CoralView no longer distributes the, uh, the original one, the large one. I cannot pronounce that name. AC, oh, maybe it's Ace in Polar. Does that mean you're up in Alaska? Anyway, he says he's planning to put glass tops on his tank. And how do I, th you know, what are my thoughts? Uh, if you're in a really cold climate and you're trying to trap the temperature in the tank, that makes sense. If you're trying to keep fish from jumping out, that makes sense. If you're trying to maintain oxygen levels, it doesn't make as much sense. We tend to have our tanks open on the top for saltwater and reef tanks. But a lot of people put screens on top of their tank that, you know, just looks like a mesh screen to keep the fish from jumping out, but lets oxygen exchange and CO2 exit the tank and, uh, you know, just provides good oxygen for the water level, for the, for the display tank. Travis Savant says he has everything on a power strip, so when he has to do a water change, he just flips off the switch, and everything on that strip is killed. That'll work. That's smart. I, um, I tend to be more of a control freak in the regard. I like to turn off many different things, and I use the American DJ switch switches, and each one has a, you know, it says calcium reactor, it says uh, biopower reactor, it says return pump, um, top-off system, all the different things, and I would just literally flip the switches on mine one at a time. Travis, I don't know if I got your email, but feel free to resend it. I am behind on emails. How are you in a dry desert with the name Polar in your name? <laughs> dry desert, low humidity. Yeah, I could see where you'd evaporate a lot of water, but you know what? That doesn't matter. Evaporation is fine. You just replace it with more, uh, more fresh water. Yes, Pete, you can definitely use a micro on a 150-gallon tank. Um, I'm using mine on a 60-gallon I know it would work just as well on a bigger tank. I mean, what is it? It's the exact same thing as the other one. It just has a different sensor and apparently doesn't beep as much. So I feel like you could definitely do that. It, I think it was designed for those little tanks and uh, that's how it went to market. The one from IceCap I showed you, that one would definitely work on the bigger tank. And it's very similar to Smart ATO. It's just designed a little differently. Reefing with O says, another benefit of the ATK is it comes with the FMM. You have two free slots where you can add additional switches. I added a Neptune flow sensor and an optical switch to monitor my ATO level. Um, Carlos asked me, which ATO do you believe the most reliable? You're talking to a guy that 15 years ago, had a float switch connected to an extension cord and used it that way and never had a problem. Not once. It, uh, and that was a $8 solution. <laughs> so I don't know if you should trust me. <laughs> I really, the Smart ATO, the Smart ATO Micro, both of those have done really well. Just had the annoying thing of occasionally it would just decide to beep and stop adding water and if I wasn't here to deal with it, it couldn't add water until I resolved the situation. That was a minor annoyance. It's not the end of the world. I really do want to try out the ice cap ATO and see what it does. Um, I have no reason to doubt that it's not going to be reliable. I think the ATK is probably the most reliable of the ones I showed today because it has so much redundancy, it's not even funny. The deluxe top it off kit that I showed you guys was um, a DIY project. Like I said, for 50 bucks, you build it yourself. You add your own extension cord, you add your own power head you know, to move it and some tubing. So you need those things. That might cost you another 20 bucks, maybe. And uh, so for $70, you can make it. And I, like I said, I used mine for years and years. And I used two switches uh, for redundancy. That kit came with three. 
And with three, you could have two low and you could have one up high in case it ever added way too much water. Or you could put the third switch possibly in the reservoir to tell it to add more water. Speaking, I, I forgot to mention that. The smart ATO has a, another sensor that when the water got too low in the reservoir, it would beep and let you know to refill it, which is nice if you put it in a cabinet and you never look at it. Um, I do not know if the ATK does that. I do not know if the ice cap ATO does that. I will try to find out, obviously. I want to know that. But my container never gets empty to the point where it beeps. Never, ever, ever. First of all, I can see mine. It's in plain sight. And I have enough water to top off my reef for about 11 days in a row. And about once a week, I refill it. It never gets down to the bottom. Usually, I have eight or nine inches of water still left in the container when I top off with more water. And that takes a few hours to fill it up because it holds 45 gallons of water. Uh, Tunzi Osmolator. I didn't even mention that. That is another one that people have been using reliably for years. So yes, you can trust that one. I believe the Osmolator costs about $180 for that kit. And it uses kind of a similar shaped pump like you saw for the um, ATK. It's a round one. And you would stand that up inside your reservoir. I, I, if it doesn't have a bracket, it tends to fall over. I don't think that matters. I mean, unless you're trying to get every last drop of water out of your container. Something that I have not mentioned yet as we're wrapping this up is that you should clean out your top off reservoir from time to time with some bleach water. Really clean it, reset it, so that way it's fresh again. Just like you wash your car, you clean your shower, you scrub the sink in the kitchen. You know, these are things we do occasionally, right? Because it just needs to be done. Your top off container, as you add water, can slowly start to build up crud on the inside one way or another. Whether salt migrates in there, lighting hits and algae grows, you know, whatever's going on, you want to clean it out so that it measures zero TDS. And so if you put in a TDS meter today or grab a sample out is what I would recommend and then measure that. If it's measuring 15, 20, 25, 30, your container is actually contaminating your RODI water. You're spending all this money to make pure water and then you're putting in a container that contaminates it. So you want to make sure to drain it, clean it, dry it out, refill it with RODI water and measure the TDS, make sure it's clean again. And that way it's topping off your tank with nice pure water. All right, guys, what else can I tell you? Okay, um, I'm gonna switch gears here for a minute. The Reef Trace app is out. It's for iOS. And every single time I say that, someone always says, what about Android? Well, guess what? We're working on Android. Um, I say we, they. I talked to the developer yesterday about this and the day before, actually, I talk with them every day. <laughs> and got some really cool things in the works. So uh, number one, Reef Trace is working great. Um, it rolled out about a week ago and they worked on it every single day to add little tiny uh, nuances to make it better and better. Um, you can track all of your water parameters in there. You can share those results with others. You can graph them, which is all built in. It's got the LFS locator built in. If you run in, if you're using this app and you don't see all the fish stores in your area, we want to know because this developer had all of his minions call every single store in the U.S. to make sure they were open and in business so they weren't just adding a bunch of names that weren't in existence. Um, so if, for, like I saw someone mention that San Antonio didn't cover all of the stores. So you have to let them know. Go to reeftrace.com, hit contact us, let them know. Um, now, for the Android people, they're going to start working on the Android version in December, and it would probably come out in January. But that's a long way away, and I know you don't like that. And so what we've come up with, and I say we because I keep getting involved in these conversations, but it's them. Um, they are going to make it where Android users can enter their data on the Reef Trace website. And that way, when the app comes out for Android, you'll download the app and all of your data that you've been storing in the cloud will then propagate into the app immediately into your phone, which is awesome. So you will actually be able to enter your data now and share it just like the iOS people are doing. And then something else that's in the works, I'm just gonna say it. If it doesn't happen, so be it, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna happen. The, um, the app already measures all the water parameters. Uh, they just added the ability to add TDS to the app as well. So now when you are um, measuring your source water and you say, hey, my source water where I live is 500 TDS, that information is going to go to the cloud. And 
we users are going to be able to go to reeftrace.com and see the water uh, quality across the nation. It's going to be so neat to see the averages or to see the different parts of the U.S. or different parts of the world where we can see what kind of water we're getting in spring and summer and winter and in fall based on you guys adding your information. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of the uh, app that came out years ago called Gas Buddy. Gas Buddy is a gas station app where you would drive down the street and you saw the gas station by you and they charged $1.99 a gallon and you entered. Texaco has $1.99 a gallon. And then you drove up the street further and Costco, one eighty seven a gallon. And then you drove further down the street and then Union 76 had you know, two nineteen a gallon. And then everyone else that has the app could open the app and see what the price of gas was near them and find the best deal. Okay, so because everyone collectively added information, it benefited everyone. And it's the same thing. Now, if, you're, if we are all entering our data of our alkalinity, of our calcium, of our magnesium, that creates a massive number of uh, data points to get averages of what the average hobbyist in the U.S. has in their tank. I know it's not specific to regions, but who knows, that might come later. But, so we can find out averages which in you know per country, which I think is awesome. Then we can turn around and we can find out how TDS is changing throughout the year based on what we're doing. So measuring that from time to time. It's it's not really my water, I okay, my RO unit is zero. You know, that's not really interesting. But knowing what the source water is in your area, I think that would be a really good thing for us to amass as a group of information. And then um the most exciting thing is something I actually suggested four years ago in my Magna talk. A lot of us measure our PAR under our lighting, and then we take a picture of our tank, and we superimpose all these numbers on the picture, and we share that on a forum or on social media, and we're like, here's my PAR measurements under my Radeon Gen 3, or here are my PAR measurements under my AP700 by Kessel. And others of us just look at it and say, okay, that's neat. <laughs> But if more of us could measure our PAR and then enter it into Reef Trace, we could actually have PAR measurements that would be under, and you could, the way I see it, whoever's got a Radeon Gen 4, we could see all of the PAR measurements and get an idea of what typically does best for specific corals. And I know that's a big undertaking, but you know what? I think we can do it. I think it'll be awesome. And so PAR measurements should be added to Reef Trace in the upcoming future. And that will be great for both Android and for uh, iOS users. And I'm very excited about that because I always wanted to know what those best averages are. And we've heard speakers talk about it. You know, there's three or four people in the US, including myself, that have put PAR readings and, and uh, done measurements ourselves in our own tanks. Sanjay Yoshi is famous for his PAR presentations, but collectively, we are just readers, we're not participants. Nowadays, we can get our own PAR sensor. Uh, Apex sells one that hooks up directly. At MACNA this year, they were showing a new PAR sensor from uh, Apogee Industries, I think is the name of the company. And it's Bluetooth, so it works with any smartphone, and you could measure PAR in your tank. Um, you can, of course, buy the regular PAR meter itself. You might be able to borrow PAR meter from your fish store or from your local club. And I would suggest measuring it at zero inches and then six, 12, 18, 24. I think that if we all did the exact same measurement, zero, six, 12, 18, you know, depending on the height of your tank, obviously a smaller tank, you can't go like a nano, you might only get to go 12 inches down. But if we could get light fixture and then the equal measurement straight down, that would be a great starting point. And it would also allow for variances where there's mistakes being made by individuals. Because if you have a thousand people provide these numbers and you have like three or four really way out there numbers, it'll kind of ignore those and the averages will become more realistic. But I just love the idea of us sharing our data. So I'm really excited. Oh, look, Reef Trace commented PAR readings will be available in January. Yay, it is going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been pushing for it, but you know, you just never know. So I'm very excited to see this. Uh, one part, Carlos says a 3D PAR map would be cool. So... I am excited about these changes, these things that are making it better and better. I'm very excited about that. Fish Frenzy asked me to do a shout out. That means you're all supposed to go to his channel and look at his videos, I think. I did it, I did it. You owe me $5. <laughs> okay, uh, what else can I tell you? I think that's it. I think that's it for this week. 
Um, there'll be another video coming out later this week. I'm not sure what. Um, something cute and small, I'm sure. And then we'll have a stream next Saturday. And uh, I will come up with a topic, and you'll get to find out what that is. And um, I'm just going to end this thing right now before I sound like I don't know what I'm talking about. Thank you so much for tuning in. And a lot of you showed up today. I'd say over 100 of you showed up for this stream. And some of you left because I kept talking too long. But I apologize for that. Happy reefing. If you have questions, post them in the comments below this video. And uh, I'll see you guys on social media.